Hello. This week, in a continuation of the discussion about the birth process, I am incredibly privileged to have Amanda Burley with me. I'm a huge fan of Amanda's work and all that she has achieved in maternity services. So without further ado, let's say hello to you, Amanda, and let me get you to introduce yourself. Hi, Sally. I'd like to say thanks ever so much for inviting me to do this podcast with you. It's a really important, it's a subject that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, my name is Amanda Burley. I've been a clinical midwife for almost 30 years. I um, worked predominantly on the day at delivery suites um, during the first 16 years of my, um, my career. And then afterwards, I had a little sojourn to New Zealand um, in 2003. And then when I came back, I started back at work as a midwife in the hospital again. I have two boys and um, they followed my journey whilst I've been passionate about changing practice with optimal core clamping. In 2012, I won Yorkshire Evening Post Midwife of the Year. And in 2015, I won British Journal of Midwives Midwife of the Year for the work that I do with optimal core clamping. I was also very privileged to be part of a team that developed the Basics Trolley, which is a mini resuscitator um, that can be used for premature and compromised babies uh, to keep the cord intact and we developed that in 2010 and we won an award in um, 2011 at the Medical Innovations. It's been an interesting journey. Um, I am seen as a bit of a whistleblower and I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like me to be quiet about this and my journey with optimal core clamping, you know, I qualified as a midwife in 1988 but the penny didn't drop for me until 2005 and when the penny dropped and I realised that we weren't practising evidence-based practice I set about changing practice. Yeah. So what do you mean by evidence-based practice? Well, as a midwife, um, we were taught by rote when we first qualified as uh, midwives or when we were trained, we were taught by rote our seniors taught us how to um, work with women, help deliver babies. Um, but then there was a, a, a specific time when everything that we did had to be evidence-based and that came in. So everything, had the, the things that we use on babies, cord clamps, um, cord cleaning, nappies, nappy cream, breast, everything had to be evidence-based. And all our practice, and that is part of our code as midwives, we have to do evidence-based practice. In 2005, I realised that what we were doing as, a midw as midwives and doctors in cutting the cord immediately wasn't evidence-based, there was no evidence to support it. There was quite a few years before that where I was looking for something, uh, which would you like me to go on and tell you about that? Yes, please. I've got two boys that were born in 1994 and 1997. Um, they both were diagnosed and with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and that's in the family. So I'm not saying that immediate core clamping causes attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or autistic spectrum disorders, although I don't think it helps at all. Um, but because the, the children needed special needs, they had special, they were considered special needs at school. Um, I was in contact with the teachers, the supportive teachers, who said that they thought that there's something going wrong. They said every class, particularly teachers that have been qualified for a long, long time said that the classroom, in every classroom, they had a table of children who had learning problems and behavioural problems, and they didn't know why this was happening. So I set about looking to see if there was any common denominator um, in this. And this was probably, I'm just thinking about the time scale, probably about 2000, year 2000, maybe 1999. So I started looking at different things because we had midwives as well that had children that were slightly different. And for example, we had six job share midwives and we had 14 children between us. We had nine boys, five girls, but seven of the boys were considered to have learning problems, uh, which was far too much of a coincidence for me. And then with other midwives, there was other midwives on the world that had other children that had difficulties. So I started to look at, to see if it's anything specific to midwifery. Um, so asking questions, it wasn't randomized control trial or anything like that. It was asking people about what their uh, behavior was, did they, did they take too much sugar? Did they drink too much tea or coffee in pregnancy? Did they smoke? Um, was a drink, was a wacky backy? Was it um, the scrub that we used in the theatre, the betadine scrub? There was, to see if there was a common denominator. And then I remember very clearly, always having this in the back of my mind, and it was quite forensic, um, I have quite a forensic mind, but always having that in the back of my mind and sort of looking at things to see if there was 
any lead in the pipes at home or we live in the fields, was there any fertiliser on the fields? And then I watched a TV programme, and this is part of my story, and it's called Vera Drake. And Vera Drake is about an abortion, abortionist in the 1960s. And she learned how to do abortions and she used to go along and help women who were in trouble. So they were either had huge families and couldn't look after another child, or they were young women that weren't married who needed help. And she used to do the terminations. She never took any money for them. It was altruistic. And then she was caught and imprisoned. And at the end of the film, it said, somebody came up and said, oh, did your, we did the same as you. Did your women die? And she said, what are you on about? She said, what do you mean did one women die? And they said, well, our women died. You know, did your women die? And you saw this flash of light, this light bulb moment where she realised that what she was doing and thought she was being kind and helpful was actually causing harm. And I went to the Lake District that week and I really thought about this film. And I suddenly thought about our practice at midwives and the third stage of labour. And at that time, babies were born and we used to clamp and cut the cord immediately. That's the way we were trained and we just did it. Everybody did. Um, and then I started looking into, I thought, gosh, the penny dropped then and I started looking for the research that was on the internet. And the, the stuff that I could find was, uh, the main thing that I could find was um, an article by George Morley, he'd done some work, he was an obstetrician in America. And he said that the core clamp was the most dangerous piece of obstetric equipment that's ever been made. And that he thought, well, he, he, he'd done research on monkeys where monkeys that had immediate core clamping, it caused irreversible brain damage and quite often killed the monkey and that it deprived the baby of 30% of the blood volume. And the more I looked into this, people were saying the same. We knew then that we were depriving the baby 30% of the blood volume that they should get with a natural transition. Um, so I thought, gosh, this is horrendous. We don't do, we don't do evidence-based practice, let's um, change it. So I wrote to an obstetrician, um, a neonatologist, an anaesthetist and the midwifery manager and the midwifery manager said, well, I worked at a different hospital. We did do that. We did, we did wait till the core stopped pulsating, which I found out since is extremely rare. Um, I met two midwives in the same hospital. It's a small hospital in Yorkshire, but everywhere else seems to have done immediate core clamping. The obstetrician didn't come to me. The anaesthetist said to me, we had a conversation and he said, I think you could be right. He said, but I'd keep your mouth shut if I were you. And the neonatologist met me for a meeting and we had a really heart to heart discussion about it. And he said, I can tell you're passionate about this. And he said, but what you need to do is get evidence to say what you're saying is right. And then we can talk about changing practice. So I said, on the contrary, we haven't actually got any evidence to say that what we're doing is right. So you have to turn it on its tail and say, we're not, we're, we're not doing evidence-based practice. And he wrote a letter to the midwifery management to say that I had an interesting theory and that regards the neonatal unit of the hospital that I worked, it did, he had no concerns about when we clamped and cut the cord. It didn't, you know. But that was 2006, I think. Um, and it was dropped. It was really difficult. People didn't want to do it. They thought I was off my trolley completely. Um, I did speak to some doctors and they were saying, you know, who is this woman? And then I ended up going into community. And I was in community. And obviously, as a community midwife, you give your women and their partners um, evidence-based practice so I pointed them in the right direction for a few articles. Judith Mercer is a midwife in America who is absolutely fantastic she's still working she's in her 70s and she is determined along with some really top-notch researchers that they're going to get this um, changed globally and um, she'd done a lot of work on premature babies as well. So I told all the women about some of the women that were in my care um, about this and then asked them to go do their own research. And if they decided that they wanted optimal core clamp, we should write it in the notes. Um, because at that time we were doing immediate clamping on all babies. It didn't go down very well. The manager was very, very suspicious about me. Um, it particularly got quite grave when the doctors were coming down saying, who is this midwife? You'll have to shut her up. Uh, because women that were having cesarean sections were asking for delayed core clamping. And this was 15 years ago. So it was a bit of a lead balloon. I did do an audit and it showed that the babies at the hospital were getting immediate core clumping. 75% of the babies were getting immediate core clumping. Some women were having um, physiological third stages where the babies, they weren't clumped at all. Um, that was a very rare incidence when I was training. Um, but these women 
and it was 25% of babies did actually get delayed core clamping, which is really quite high. That was one in four. Yeah. I did do some teachings for the, the midwives and that changed around. And in two years time, we turned it around to say that 75% of babies were getting delayed core, core clamping and 25% were getting immediate core clamping for reasons such as to put the baby in skin to skin, which to me was absurd really, because a baby can go to skin to skin. It's a perfect position for the baby to be being to have optimal core clamping and it wasn't a reason to clamp and cut the cord. The hospital at the time was still really, really edgy. I did try to, when we had a meeting, I asked if they could do five minutes delay core clamping and they were, they were horrified. And then I said, well, can we do two minutes? And they were horrified. So I said in the end, I said, well, do you think we could possibly just let the baby breathe before we clamp and cut the cord? And they hummed and hard and said, possibly be. And it was written into the hospital trust notes that it was suggested that the baby is allowed to breathe before the cord was cut, but we need more evidence to support this. And I thought in years to come, this is going to be, you know, people are going to look back and think, well, because I do believe that immediate core clamping has been one of the biggest travesties and one of the biggest failures in medical history, really, for babies and um, sub subsequent health. Um, where are we now? <sighs> nice guidelines came out in... Um, well, the World Health Organization, when I first started this in 2005, were advocating immediate core clamping. They changed in 2007 to say that it's, um, it should be delayed core clamping for at least a minute. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists changed their guidance to say 2009. And they said at the same time that the time of clamping and cutting the cord should be documented in the notes. And that's never been done. Um, Royal College of Midwives said in 2012 that they um, supported delayed core clamping and that midwives should be proficient in third stage, uh, physiological third stage management, as well as delayed core clamping. They didn't say a time, but I thought that was a movement in the right di direction because I do feel there is a place where a woman has had a natural birth with no intervention, that we should be questioning why we go in and manage the third stage if there's no risk factors. It should be, it shouldn't be, um, manage third stage for everybody. It should be selective, you know, for women that are at higher risk um, because manage third stage can always be implemented if any problems arise. And it shows that, you know, managing the third stage by giving the oxytocin drug, there isn't much difference in the risk to PPH at the timing of giving that drug. So even if somebody has a physiological third stage and wants that, if there's any problems, they can change to active management. Um, nice came out in 2014, which was seven years after I'd said that we should be doing immediate core clamping and said that they, they should leave the cord from one to five minutes. Again, one minute was a disappointment, but it was better than no minutes, which is what people were doing. Um, there's still no evidence to say that one minute is acceptable. There's no, there's no evidence to say that one minute doesn't cause harm. And the researchers, Judith Mercer said minimum of three minutes. Oloranda said a minute of uh, a minimum of five minutes, and Stuart Hooper said a minimum of ten minutes. But in a baby that is low risk, who is having natural transition, we should be really we should be watching the baby, not the clock, and that is really important. Some babies need, need longer than others. Let's yeah. talk about the harm. What what is the harm that's caused by the baby not receiving? all the blood that actually belongs to the baby. So all the blood that's in the placenta that remains in the placenta at the moment that the cord is cut and clamped is basically yeah. incinerated, thrown away, wasted. It belongs to the baby. Yeah. What sort of harm can be done by cutting it prematurely? A baby loses 30% of the blood volume. And I think this is one, an illustration of this is Adults can only give away one eighth of their blood. They can give away one pint. Children can't give away any of their blood, but we expect a baby to give away 30% of their blood volume or lose 30% of their blood volume and be okay. We do need more research, but we do know that it causes anemia and um, a decrease, a deficiency in hematocrits. Anemia is 
hugely important for neurological functions. There's a lot of different, you could go to the physiological, clamping and cutting the cord. Um, well, a baby that's been transitioned goes through six changes, bodily changes, and clamping and cutting that cord actually enforces those changes to happen quickly. It changes all the pressures in the body, which can adversely affect um, the, the transition. So if you've got a baby that needs the blood in the core, it will take blood away from the, um, the peripheral uh, surfaces, so the brain and things like that. So that's, that's a big subject in itself. If we could just focus on the anemia, we know it causes anemia. Ulla Anderson has done, well, a lot of the researchers have done studies on this, and it shows that a baby that has immediate core clamping or early core clamping has got much more chance of anemia. Ulla Anderson went on and did a study at children at the age of four, and he shows that, particularly the males, they have decreased fine motor and social skills than a baby that's had optimal core clamping. Um, anemia is prevalent in... I think it's 45% of the children that are born right across the globe. An optimal core clamping is one way where we can decrease the, the effects of anemia. Um, and anemia is important right at the beginning, but it's also important in productivity for that whole child's life, the long-term um, health of that child. Because even though you can give tablets for anemia, um, it doesn't quite correct the anemia, the anemia that the baby suffers right at the beginning. Um, we also know there's lots of studies now that show that early core clamping in babies that are premature and compromised, it, it increases the mortality of babies by 27 to 30%. So 27, 27 to 30% of babies that have immediate core clamping have got more chance of dying. And we know that optimal core clamping across the globe can save upwards of 100,000 babies. Um, you've got blood that's going across, it's, it's oxid. It's, it's like I say, I talked to um, an ambulance crew once, and ambulance crews are always terrified of going out to babies that have been born. They'd rather go to a road traffic accident. So I said, if you went out to a baby that was, no, if you went out to a person who wasn't breathing, but they weren't bleeding, or you went out to a person there wasn't breathing, that had lost a third of their blood, who would it be easier to resuscitate? And that's the same with babies. It's much more, you've got much more chance of having a healthy baby with a, a transition or delay core clumping. Yeah. With regards to um, the words, it's interesting because you call it optimal cord clamping, yeah. and yet a lot of parents listening to this may have heard the phrase delayed cord clamping. Do you want to explain that a little bit? Yeah, there's lots of different things for it now. It used to be um, delayed. And people say delaying cord clamping is it's like an intervention. But at the time, immediate cord clamping was normal practice. So to get people to change from normal practice, immediate cord clamping, to delayed cord clamping, which was leaving the cord, we had to have a term for delayed cord clamping. So people used to say delay clamping, delay clamping the cord. Optimal core clamping was something that came afterwards, that came in stages really. It went from immediate core clamping to delay core clamping, which was also can be deferred core clamping um, to optimal core clamping. And I think optimal core clamping describes what is optimal for each baby. So you could have a premature baby, um, very little, um, without any bedside resuscitation. Optimal core clamping for that baby would be probably 60 seconds because it gives you a chance to simulate the baby, give rescue breaths by the mum, and then transfer to a standard resuscitator. Optimal core clamping for a baby where there is bedside resuscitator, you could do, it could be longer, it could be much longer because you do the simulation by the bed, transfer the baby to the trolley, which is still connected to the cord, and you could keep that cord intact for however minutes it takes. Another baby, some babies can do optimal core clamping, which is when the cord goes white and they have a perfect transition. So we'll say for a normal um, term baby, optimal core clamping for me is when the cord has finished doing its job, the transition, the baby's transited, it's pink, it's crying, and the cord has gone white and it's finished its job, there's no pulsations in it. And that for me is the optimal core clamping in the majority of babies, which are full term babies. It really varies. Having been at 
hundreds of births over the last 20 years, I can honestly tell you that since I started to become aware of this, uh, you know, ability to leave the cord alone and to let it to finish pulsating, I've seen some cords be white literally within a few yeah. minutes and others take up to 40 or more minutes. Yeah. And that's the beauty of optimal, isn't it? Is that where does the baby need to be? As long as everything's okay, yeah. the baby can literally be skin to skin, receiving all of its microbiome, which is a subject that we talked about on last week's podcast, totally like yeah. bonding, yeah. releasing hormones and just attached to the cord there is no benefit at that point to cutting clamping and removing the baby there's no benefits whatsoever so it is really important that I think anyone listening to this recognizes the difference between delayed and optimal because yeah. optimal really is about the baby it's about letting the baby decide or letting the process happen absolutely naturally yeah. and being ready and I hear what you're saying is that in some instances there will be um, a time when the baby's cord needs to be cut because the baby may need more support but of course whilst it's attached to the placenta it's still the baby is still receiving yeah. oxygen mm, um, it is. that's a very important thing for everyone to know it is is. That whilst the baby is receiving oxygen through the umbilical cord there is no need to whisk it across the room to give it oxygen which mm, seems yeah. like you know a bit of a pointless practice but there it is. i it mean is. i trust that any medical professional in a situation will always do the right thing by the baby. But what you're saying is actually they need to unlearn some of the skills they learn yeah. during their training, which was considered to be um, evidence-based practice. Actually, it never was evidence. No, it wasn't. No, so absolutely right, Sally. Yeah. there is no need for that practice to continue because there's nothing to suggest it has any benefits to anyone. In no. fact, it can cause harm. So it's absolutely fascinating. I love this subject. Um, yeah. One of the things that happened is that you started to campaign. Tell us a little bit about where what happened next. You know, as you as you were so sure wholeheartedly that this was an issue you know you went on to really promote this worldwide that's the way it happened really yeah because um when I first started one of the managers took me in a room and said right you've managed to get the guidelines changed to say that the baby should possibly be able to breathe before we clamped and cut the cord and she said can you be quiet now and I said no I really, I really was quite uh, uh, naughty because I'd noticed at that time that they were, they were, they were quite oppressive. Anyway, I um, I started a Facebook page up because I thought, no, this has got to roll out. We've, we're doing this globally, right across the globe, and we are damaging babies every day, every second of the day, a baby's being damaged, and we have. We've exported bad practice to the colonies that we, you know, that, that, that a lot of the colonies are clamping and cutting one because they don't have the time, and they they think it's absurd that we do delay core clamping. Um, so they asked me to be quiet and I said well no because this is something that needs rolling out and I think they were worried about it because obviously it means that we've been doing something wrong for 50 years really. Um, the Daily Mail, I got. A, they asked me if they could do an article on it and it was a really really good journalist, there are some good journalists in the Daily Mail even though um, and at any time that any of the, the papers have done an article, I've always asked if I can read it before it goes out. And they've always they've always allowed me to do that and make changes. So I had an article in the Daily Mail. I um I set up a Facebook page. It's called Optimal Core Clamping Weight for White, and that was in 2012. And then I set up a petition against Nice because Nice nobody wanted to change practice because Nice were recommending immediate core clamping. Everybody needs permission to do something. So to go against NICE meant that people were having to step outside their box and make decisions based on their own finding. And of course, everybody's worried because we do do defensive practice now. So I, I set about petitioning NICE. And I think it's got five and a half thousand signatures from 44 different countries. Wow. So that sort of gave me a bit of a name, really. And the, the Facebook page took off. I met some... There was another midwife in Australia called Annie Barnes, and we were in commu close communication. And there was also other midwives. There was a midwife from Norway who's still, we're all still very active, and a doula from Sweden. 
Um, but Annie came on the page with me and um, we, we ended up getting 26,000 likers. We're still about 26,000 likers, but that really took off where we, we share the, um, the research, all the research articles and parents' stories. If anybody wants to write to us with their story about what happened. And it was really because there was a lot of resistance. Parents were finding a lot of resistance going into the hospitals and some of them still do. And I think it gave parents um, to read other people's experience where they've stood up in a medicalized model and said, no, you're not doing that to our baby, um, was really quite empowering for people. So we, we continue to do that. Um, I think the award win for the 2012 the Yorkshire Union Post, that really put that on the map. And, I, and it's nice to win awards, but the most important thing about winning the awards is it's the publicity it brings with it. Because the publicity that it brings with it means that it's like a Mexican wave. It rolls out. And so you can have a little article that goes into a local newspaper, which was our Leeds paper or Yorkshire paper. And then it rolled out to the, the big tabloids in the UK, which then rolled out to Turkey, to Australia, to America, the CNN news. The people at work were delighted, by the way, not. Um, but it really sort of sends those ripples through that people start picking up and then you get other people that take on the other activists that come up and say, actually, this is a really good idea. Can we help? And all around us, and there's lots of people that are in this movement. There's um, the top researchers. There's a lot of activist midwives like myself. There's other midwives that are in those that aren't such activists. But then you've got parents and you've got people who aren't parents who are very, very, you can just see it because this isn't rocket science. This is not rocket science, you know, this is nature as nature intended and we shouldn't be intervening. So the more people that get on board is great. And if anybody wants to write to me and join in, that's absolutely great. Um, and we still need to continue. I think it's not the easiest ride. I think being a change agent, particularly in an NHS model is not being an easy journey by all at all. And, um, even though I think I've been quite brave or quite stupid in some places, I think I've had, I did get, get caught out because I can campaign quite voraciously and some of the people at the top don't particularly like it. But we just have to continue because we have to stop doing this. We're damaging baby right across the world. And of course, with the advent of core blood companies in and their advertising, and they believe in what they're doing, but we want the blood to be in the baby, whereas other factors would like the blood to be in a lab or being donated. Yeah. So just explain that slightly. So if I was in a, a pregnant person and I was looking into cord blood banking, is that what you mean? Why would, yeah, you, so, yeah. why would you recommend that is actually not a good plan? I think it's not that. I think it's, it's there's informed choice. I think any parent that is considering donating or storing their baby's blood needs to really examine the evidence. Because I think one of the things that happens at the moment is everybody sees it as a really good thing. You can store your baby's blood and if they're ill in later life, uh, there might be a chance of improving their health or making them better uh, by the blood. But if you look at that in a, a bigger picture, how many children do you actually know at the moment would need that service mm. and so it's a bit of a needle in the haystack i think the other thing is the go on i was just going to say i think from what when i discuss this with my clients um i always talk about the stem cells in the blood and if they're losing a third of the blood volume at the point of birth and it takes approximately yeah. six months to replenish that stock of blood that was missing that should have gone into the baby at the point of birth. Think of all the stem yeah. cells that were lost yeah. that could have been in the baby working to keep the baby well, because that's where you yeah. started from, wasn't it? Your starting point was what is going on with some of these children that can yeah. be explained by an event that happens at birth. You're absolutely right. The stem cells and we we haven't got that evidence to say that taking a third of the baby's stem cells is, is okay. We started doing immediate core clamping in the 50s and 60s. So people are coming up to now 60, 60 years old, around 60. Um, and it'd be interesting to see how these babies that had immediate core clamping, how they're gonna fare in the next 20 years because they lost a third of their stem cells. And we don't have that evidence. We know that stem cells are incredibly important. We know that they're the building blocks of the future. 
but nobody really knows the effects of taking a third at birth. Um, and we know that the stem cells can go into a baby's body and if there's any damage, they can go to that place and change into what they are and repair that damage. Um, and I think it's, parents have this decision to make, but they need to be given the evidence. Um, I think there's, there's two different types to the cold blood companies and then there's the cold blood do um, charities. And the cold blood charities, uh, the way they've got around this being okay is because we did do immediate core clamping and they claim that the blood in the cord is a waste product. We now know that this is not a waste product, but you will see on the websites quite happily they have put, this is a waste product. It isn't a waste product. It should be in the baby. Um, and the charities are very keen and I know this, they, they have targets of 150 mils per baby if they can get it. The blood volume per baby is between 90 and 110, nearer 110 mils per kilo, which is knocking on 400 mils, 370, 400 mils around. To take 150 mils from that baby, we know that that's over, that's 30% plus, and it can be. And in premature babies, it can be 50% of the blood because more of the blood gets back in the placenta. Um, and they don't look at a specific baby to see if a specific baby is okay to lose that blood. It's right across the board. And I think that although they are they are covered from the agencies, it's something that isn't taken seriously. And I do know that I brought it up with MPs about the cold blood companies. And they said, because a hospital does receive recompense, it's okay because the NHS is there to make a profit. So it's a big murky um, situation that, um, I don't want to say too much about there are there is some companies that will use a small amount the pathology is there to use a small amount of cord blood um and that'd be great if that's the way forward that's great you can have the best of both worlds you can take a small amount from the placenta after the baby's had a transition um and then that's great yeah absolutely um, let's go back because you did actually manage to make some changes didn't you in 2014 I think was that the NICE guidance? Yeah, I was credited with changing NICE with my petition, but to be honest, I don't think, I think I didn't actually physically sit there in the room and change the guidance. I know there was one midwife, Tracy Cooper, who was part of the team that changed the guidance, but I think I was credited, which we all thought was quite funny, but we were really pleased because I was credited with it because I made so much noise and my noise would have got louder if they hadn't have changed it. But, um, and the publicity that came out, Back, I got credited with changing it, but I think because I've made the noise and they were aware of me. Um, and I suppose with any smoke without, no smoke without fire, maybe it made let people look into it a bit more. Um, but they only really changed it for a very short space of time. So it was, you know, what, 90 seconds or roughly? What was the guideline? One minute. It was one minute to, it was one minute to five minutes. But because it's one to five minutes, you do find that people that are changing practice will they also find the one minute very difficult. I know a lot of people have found yeah, the one minute I, very difficult. And I think what, what is confusing, and this actually came up in a conversation that I had in a local maternity services a few years ago, was mm -hmm. that the head of midwifery um, acknowledged that they did delayed cord clamping. And she was like, oh, yeah, 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 we definitely do it. But you see what she was offering was one minute. It wasn't um, the whole the whole thing, which was to, to be optimal and to leave, leave it alone until it finished pulsating. So what came next was that you kind of ramped up your campaign, didn't you? And you made a hashtag, wait for yeah. white. Can you talk us through yeah. that? Well, wait for white is a description of what the course should look like when it's clamped. Um, so, and it's, it's a really easy catchphrase, um, hashtag wait for white that people understand globally, they all understand wait for white, because the cord does change from being full of blood and some babies cords are much fuller with blood. And um, I did practice at a time when we clamped and crossed it and I look back now and I think, gosh, um, how did I think that was okay? But now a cord will continue to pulsate and then it will go white. So we say to everybody, wait for white. It's a really good description for clinicians but it's a fantastic description for parents because they can look up even if they've given birth they can look up and think yes the cord's white you can go further than that by touch the cord and just see if there's any pulsations in it um but a cord will go it will go white and the difference in these babies 
it's phenomenal because I did work on a delivery suite for 16 years where we did do immediate core clamping. And then my last experience as a midwife was in um, it's three years ago, two years ago. And we were, I worked on a birth center where the babies all had weight for white. And the difference in the babies is phenomenal. Babies that have immediate core clamping will cry because things are being interrupted. They seem a bit distressed, a bit agitated. Um, whereas a baby that has optimal core clamping will be much more serene, less likely to cry. And after a little while and they've transited, it's like they've been here before and they look around the room, they adjust themselves to the situation they're in. It's really, it's like a spiritual um, entrance rather than a mechanical entrance. It's, um, and it has to really be to be seen, to be believed. And I'm sure Sally, you've probably seen that if you've been with somebody and they've had Absolutely. Not, I mean, they're not made to gasp. Their lungs aren't forced to inflate. They are just transitioning yeah. is the best it way is. to describe it. You know, they're just like looking around, but not sure, you know, what's going on. And then all of a sudden they're just kind of like all held warm and snugly on their on their mum's yeah. body and, and they're listening to her heartbeat and they're just taking it all in. Um, and their colour is better. Their, their colour is like so different yeah. and, you know, everything about them. And I just, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonder to watch. And it, it, it's it surprising, really, um, that we we didn't come to this realisation yeah. so much earlier. Because I know when you look back at literature, there is so many red flags all saying, mm -hmm. don't touch the cord leave yeah. the baby alone it is the most injurious thing to a newborn yeah. baby and mm -hmm. even though that information was out there um, at some point it was overlooked and ignored and thought mm -hmm. that even with no evidence that other people knew better and it, you know it became standard practice around the world and mm -hmm. you know trying to undo that is shockingly hard I, it I can't, is shockingly hard you know I can't quite I, every single time no matter what when I'm in a class teaching um couples about this and I talk about how clever the umbilical cord is and that it begins to really quickly pump the blood from the placenta back into the baby and it pulsates and you can feel it if you touch and you put your thumb and finger between you know the cord and you can feel it they always there's always one person that looks at me and says well if they know that it's bad for the baby why do they do it and I'm like I don't know and you know I no, can't I honestly don't. tell you yeah. why this became something that nobody ever questioned and I'm so grateful that you did question it because I do wonder where we would be if you hadn't stuck your head above the parapet and said let's question this people let's do something and you know even if you you feel like they're the the changes eventually happened and they weren't you know started by you they, they must have been really because it had to come from somewhere it was really strange because 2005 you think I, I always thought that somebody bigger and better would take it off me but to be frankly honest nobody dare they didn't because they knew it was going against the grain and change agents um aren't you know they're not welcomed uh, and I found that out to my cost when NICE changed the guidance in 2014 quite a few people jumped on the bandwagon then and that was quite good you know it was the people coming on supporting and stuff like that but the change then it changed people were because it was allowed so yeah. to speak people came on and said oh yeah this is this might be a good idea let's you know join in but before that it was very very lonely and I know I've mentioned Annie in Australia and I've mentioned Elizabeth in Norway and Linda and Judith you know as midwives trying to change practice but that's five people right across the globe who were and there was others but uh, and you you could get you used to get loads of flack, loads of flack. I mean, I was forever uh, pushing the corners of the envelope out and getting into serious trouble. You know, I'm not working as a midwife at the moment because I got pushed out of the profession because of it. Um, because nobody likes to be told they're wrong, um, which is fine if they're going to change the practice. But we've still got an awful long way to go. And I think that's where parents come in. Although I've been a naughty midwife and I've caused this noise, parents are the people that are really going to change things parents are the greatest change agents and I have had parents right in the early days because I worked as a community midwife and I, I'm still friends with a lot of people because they took this on board and 
had a couple from, she was from Latvia and the guy was Asian. And he had to physically stand up and hold the cord to stop the midwife cutting it. And he put his hands over it and said, you're not cutting it. They nearly had a, a fisticuffs in the middle of the delivery suite because they were saying, you're not touching it. And this was oh, a long time ago. Uh, but he said the next time he went back, where they went back with baby number two, there was a little bit less resistance. The third baby at this hospital that I worked at, there's no resistance at all now. But my grandson was born four years ago. And I know then they were like saying, can we cut it? And I said, no, <laughs> no, you can't. And he was quite pink. Um, and they came up to look at this pink baby because he got all this blood, which was completely normal. Um, but I know that he got everything. You know, he, he was in optimal condition and at one year old, his fine motor skills, he was taking a lid off a bottle and putting it back on. And, um, and parents are the people that are going to have to push this. And that's difficult for people that go into, um, into an area where there is such resistance and it shouldn't be as bad now because the guidance does say one minute. Mm. Uh, premature babies, it says one, one minute now, you know, we need to get the bedside resuscitated in so babies can have longer. Um, but you'll still get people who are a bit clamp happy and one minute isn't enough. It is not enough. We need to be looking at the baby to make sure that baby's lungs are full, they're pink, they're looking around and the cause stop pulsating. Yeah. There is no indication to do early cord clamping apart from a snap cord. So if there's a snap cord um, and the baby's in danger of bleeding out, that is the only incidence where there should be immediate cord clamping. If mum has a massive hemorrhage, you used to find that any hemorrhages start when the placenta comes away from the uterine wall, which is usually when the cord's finished its job. It doesn't tend to come away straight away. So there's even those incidences um, babies can usually get one one minute, but the snap cord is the only incidence where there should be immediate cord clamping because there is a significant debate at risk to the baby of them losing the blood. So understanding the difference between delayed, which kind of means a minute, and mm -hmm. optimal, which means let your baby's body decide when it's finished doing its job. Yeah. Um, making sure that you put these points across to a health professional that's taking care of you in advance of the birth, either on a birth plan or vocally saying, you know, no, I'm not going to cut the cord until it's finished. Wait yeah. for white is a hashtag they can say, we'd like to wait for white. So that's a really yeah. good way of them describing yeah. it. The only thing that concerns me, and I've seen this myself, yeah. is in some hospitals, let's say the baby has passed meconium or there's another concern and a paediatrician has been called to the room. Now, when I'm there working as a doula, I can take the paediatrician to one side and I can say, can I just ask you, if this baby comes out and there's no reason to cut the cord, can we just make sure we leave it? Because the client has really specifically said that they don't want the umbilical cord to be cut until it, or if it's not necessary. And actually having that conversation conversation they'll go oh okay and they won't always jump in they don't like it because actually if they've been called to the room yeah. they feel like they want to do a job but in my experience if you're you know able as the birth partner to do the same and to say right okay I just need to ask you if there isn't any reason for you to step in please don't step in they can be very receptive but otherwise they automatically go right baby's mine off across the room check them out even though the baby came out and was absolutely fine so you know do you have any tips about you know what parents can say or do that can help to make sure they advocate for themselves in a situation that isn't life-threatening I would write it in the notes I'd do a birth plan and I would make sure that the caregiver the midwife in the room um was aware of your wishes it is changing you know it is changing one minute is recommended we've just done some guidelines for the British Pediatric Association of Medicine and it recommends one minute you know we're hoping that bedside resuscitators will be coming in. Um, there's only they're few and far between at the moment. But this is evidence-based practice. I know it's difficult to sort of intervene, but it is changing. I worked at um, a hospital when I was at the birth centre, when I worked at the birth centre. And interesting in that hospital, it was Bradford, they'd done the research years ago in 2010, where they said, um, if you leave the cord pulsating for five minutes, the baby can gain up to 214 grams. The baby went from 300, 3, 
3.6 kilos to 3.8. And bizarrely, they only did one minute in most deliveries, but in the birth center, it was weight for wide. But if the pediatricians came in, or they did a cesarean section in theater, in any of the theaters, they always waited for a minute. And they'd come in, the pediatricians, and they'd put their gloves on, and they'd stand back, and they'd watch the babies, and there could be meconium, there could be anything, they'd stand back and they'd watch the babies. And then after a minute, they'd take their gloves off and leave the room because the baby had resuscitated themselves. Yeah. And over 90% of babies, I can't exactly remember, I think it's 95 to 97% or 98% of babies will resuscitate themselves with the oxygen and the blood volume. And being allowed that time, the placenta which has been looking after the baby for nine months will finish the job by making sure that baby is in perfect condition. So it's, it is changing. Um, and as for parents with that, I think, it, again, it's doing, it's doing the research to make sure that they're empowered and they understand the evidence enough to be able to, you shouldn't want to do an argument, but they could say, you know, or take in, Judith Mercer does a fantastic paper called Rethinking Placental Transfusion. And I think it's 2012, so it's quite an old paper but it is absolutely fantastic. It describes every bit, it talks about the stem cells, it talks about um, meconium, it talks about everything. And I would read that paper, I would recommend that paper to everywhere. That's Judith Mercer and it's Rethinking Placental Transfusion. Um, and they could even put, put it in the notes or let the staff read it before, you know, intervention. And I think the other thing with the babies that are more likely, you know, you're saying about meconium, but premature babies, um, which in the past, of course, that's why we designed the, um, the basics trolley, which is now the lifestyle trolley, is because we knew that those babies were the babies that benefited more from delayed core clamping, but were more likely to get immediate core clamping. And I think any parent, this should be part of their education, their antenatal education, is teaching the parents that this is what their baby needs. Um, because then if they are educated and they know the evidence, and they do get somebody that's in the room that's a bit of a Luddite, Luddite regarding core clamping that they can say, actually, no, the evidence shows. Yes. You leave it. And one minute is usually with premature babies and babies that are a bit compromised. But if you find that a baby's got meconium and it's left a minute, the chances are that baby's going to be vigorous, pink, and then the paediatrician can just hopefully take off their gloves and leave the room. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I always end this with the same question. And that is what top tip can you give to any birth partner about labour and birth? Now you've had two children yourself. Um, you've been a midwife for all these years. What would you what would you say to a birth partner about supporting a woman through birth? I would say, make sure that you are educated, that you're comfortable with the surroundings. And of course, I would say Sally, that they have to read your book. <laughs> oh, thank <laughs> but, you. <laughs> well, I do. I think it's it's very it's a nerve wracking experience. I think it doesn't have to be a nerve wracking experience, but I think education is empowerment, and I think that is so important. Um, and knowing that birth is a natural, it is a natural in most circumstances. We've done this for, well ever since time began that babies you know are birthed and a midwife or a clinician's role is there to pick up on when it's not going as smoothly but just anticipate that everything will go smoothly mobility is really important keep moving around keep hydrated keep moving around um water is a great um, a great pain relief and just enjoy it Oh, thank you so much. It's been amazing. And I learned more than I realised I was going to learn today. And I know that everyone listening to this will just be blown away by the information that you've shared. So thank you so much for your time and coming on. My pleasure. It's been really, it's been lovely to talk to you, Sally, to get that empathy because we've both been in the, in the birth. And seeing the baby's transition, the difference in the baby's transition, I think that is so incredibly important. Yeah. I just want everyone to know that this is a possibility for their babies. So uh, yeah. thank you so much. We'll My see pleasure. you. Bye. Bye.